There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Well, hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with another very involved Friday Reads. <laughs> <laughs> I have had a fabulous reading week. I have lots to tell you. Let's dive right in. I have two bales to tell you about, and both of them were failed attempts to read a book, a translated Vietnamese book for Invisible Cities. I bailed on Dumb Luck by Vu Trong Phung, which I told you I would be starting after the first chapter. It was just much too satirical. I got a strong sense in the, that very first chapter that there wasn't going to be enough character development to hold my interest in a satire. I hate satire most of the time, and I could tell that I was going to hate it. That one was translated by Peter Zinnemann and Uen Nguyet Cam. I'm sorry, I have so many names I don't know how to pronounce. I'm not going to look up each and every one, so if I don't know how to pronounce the translator's name, I'm not going to bother to look it up. I'm sorry, I just don't have time didn't like that so I went back to Scribd and in fact what I did was I searched on Amazon for Vietnamese fiction Vietnamese novel and then each time something would come up that I hadn't heard of I would see if Scribd had it and that's how I found a very slim novel a novella basically 100 pages Ticket to Childhood by Nhiet by Nguyen Nhiet Han and it was just inane. I couldn't stand it. I mean, the writing was fine, but it was just like a Vietnamese man talking about how much he resented the way his parents raised him, so he raised his kid the exact opposite. It was written, the translation was in a folksy style, and I didn't, there wasn't anything that I could see that it was made it Vietnamese. It could have been written by Garrison Keillor, but it was just a really annoying stance, like a tone to the narrative, and I, even though it was only 100 pages, I... I, I bailed after the first 25 because I hated that. So I am a stickler for following the rules with things like this. So Invisible Cities, it's not a rule, but they do suggest that it, wherever possible that you read translated works from these countries. So I think I'm going to have to let go of that because I have to say there isn't much translated Vietnamese literature that's of a length or that I can get access to on Scribd. I found a few things that seemed like the translation looks really bad, or it doesn't, the very low rating on Goodreads, and I've just done a lot of comparison shopping, and I'm not finding anything, so I'm giving up. And I think I'm going to read something that's not translated, maybe Vietnamese American. I have a couple ideas. I'm not going to take time to explain them. I'm going to do some more digging and some more sampling, and and hopefully have something to t tell you about for the Vietnam book next week. But I struck out twice in the past week. So those were my bales. Often it's the books that I finished that is kind of the low point of my Friday reads, and in this case, no way, it is the high point. Three fabulous books, especially two of them, were such Sean books. Let's start with the one that wasn't quite a Sean book, but which I very much enjoyed, and that was for Dewithon, One Moonlit Night by Caradog Pritchard, translated by Philip Mitchell. Um, this was fascinating. I highly recommend it. I'm not going to do a full review because it, it just wasn't a completely sublime experience for me. It was for many other people, but I, it was a four-star read. When I talked about beginning it, I said that it had a child narrator, and the child narrator in this novel seemed to be avoiding a lot of the pitfalls, a lot of the stuff that can go wrong with the things that I hate about child narrators, and that pretty much continued throughout. I loved the narration. This it was set during World War I in this very small mountain town in Wales. And the kid, um, who I think he's never named, yeah, mid-1910s, and just all the stuff, so much social dysfunction and crime and suicide and alcoholism and domestic violence that he witnesses, as well as moments of, there were moments of sublime, beautiful, um, capturing of experiences that weren't horrific, that were quite beautiful, that I also appreciated. The tone kept shifting. I'm not quite sure whether I totally liked how the gulf between the various tones, but I think that mostly worked for me. I was never bored. 
there was a lot more religion in here than I usually like, and I didn't love that part, to be honest. But there's also something about the way religion is shown to be quite a negative influence on a lot of the characters. So I like that, because that's true. Um, and I also probably missed some of that. I read quite a bit of commentary, including the introduction by the translator and the afterward by the late Jan Morris, who just died age 94 or something, late last year. There is a huge twist at the end, and I didn't really like it. Um, and it's what most people like. I'm not going to do any spoilers. I either missed things that kind of were foreshadowing it, or it was just way too jarring for me. But it's what most people love. So it's, it's yeah, be, pre be prepared for a shocking twist at the end. I wasn't a big fan of that. So four stars because of that. But it is the reason why this is a much beloved... I think this was voted the top... the the best novel to ever to come out of Wales in a recent poll or something. And I can see why a lot of people love it. I, I didn't love it, but I, I, I liked it. I'm glad I read it. And I will reread it because now, knowing about the twist, I would like to reread it not soon, but, you know, 10 years from now and see how, if I experience it differently without that curveball at the end. So that happened. And the other two I just finished today. By the way, I'm filming this Thursday night with my first glass of wine of the evening, because I have a busy day tomorrow. I finished a chunky novel from the Irish Readathon today, only a week late, and I don't care about those kind of timelines. The Green Road by Anne Enright, and it was absolutely fabulous. The shawniest Sean book I've read so far this year. I don't know if it's the best novel I've read. It's certainly the, the, the most my kind of a book that I have finished this year. I absolutely adored it. It's a long novel. You could say it was a short story cycle, but I don't think so. The stories were quite discreet from one another, but I don't think... I'd have to think about it some more, but I don't think they would stand alone as short stories. But some people think so, and that's very interesting. I thought it was a novel told in kind of short story form but that it that had a gathering power and the characters all did come together at the end and it was the story of an Irish family and oh who boy was this family effed up it's one of the best novels I've read about a screwed up family by focusing full chapters on each individual kid and the mother so that it opens in childhood time and we see kind of the whole family together and then we go f over the course of young adulthood into middle age we focus one chapter or one story on each of the four kids i think it was four kids and it feels very atomized because we don't get much um a little bit about their relationship with the parents but we don't get much in each of the stories about the sibling relationships and then that ends with christmas and it is not sentimental <laughs> it is so beautiful just pitch perfect exploration of how fucked up we can be but there's still hard won moments of love and connection and i mean if that is done in a hokey hallmark card way pass me the sick bag boys and girls but when it's done completely devoid of sentimentality with rich beautiful writing and it just transported me. I love, I, I want to read absolutely everything else. And Enright has written, and I am asking you for recommendations about where I should go next with her oeuvre. I have a bit of an allergy to reading about actors in fiction, but I am willing to hold my nose and try Actress, which is her latest novel. And one of the siblings in this novel was an actress, and it, I didn't have any problem with that. It's a, it's a allergy that I have that is kind of strange, and I maybe need to work on it. But I, I so I will read act, actress at some point. But should I read anything else before I go to her most recent one? Because if I love any of the others that she's put out as much as I love this, she's a new favorite. And and right, the first several years that I heard her name, I kind of thought she was a Canadian writer. I don't know how I got that mixed up, but she is an Irish writer and she is a Sean writer. And about five minutes before I turned the camera on, 
I finally finished Palace Walk, the classic Egyptian novel by Nagib Mahfouz, translated from Arabic by William Maynard Hutchins and Olive E. Kenny. So it was originally written in 1956. In some ways, I struggled with this novel, but boy, am I glad that I struggled with it. I didn't struggle with it that much, but I wasn't sure if it was going to be a Sean book until I got at least halfway through. And the last half, um, it was incredibly gripping, and I loved it. Another absolutely fantastic novel that spoke to me really deeply. Complicated relationship with it while I was reading it. It is a novel of its era, and the story is set World War II, or around 1918, 1919, by the end of the story. And boy, the misogyny in this book. I think Mahfouz did a fantastic, absolutely incredible job showing us well-rounded male characters that were so misogynistic in, in so many ways. But there is more misogyny in here than... The misogyny that is problemized. So I am not a big trigger warning kind of guy, but I would definitely put a trigger warning on this for sexual assault, sexual violence in a way that, as a novel written in 1956 by, I think, a fairly enlightened male Egyptian writer of his day, there's a lot of things left unproblematized that bothered me. And I don't think that's a failing of the novel, but that is something that I, I, I'm a little still a little bit on the fence about it, but I'm into realistic fiction. So a novel set in Egypt in 1919 that doesn't have a lot of sexual violence and misogyny would not be realistic. And perhaps the critique ends there, but certainly there is sexual violence in here that is not addressed in a way that is comfortable that is we in 2021 need it to be. I'm definitely going to read the rest of the series. It's a trilogy, the Cairo trilogy. I lived with these characters. I think I read this over three months. And it was just a family with a tyrannical patriarch who led a double life. And that's all I'll say about him. His four kids and his put-upon wife that literally didn't leave the house for 25 years, except when she went to visit her mother on a supervised chaperoned visit with her husband. Other than that, she never left the house. And whoo, 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 he plays so beguilingly with inside, outside, and what it's like when women do go outside and what it's like when men go outside because they basically just unzip and start screwing around the men. And at the end of the novel, there is an Egyptian revolution against the British colonials. It was a really good palliative to remember that the UK has very recently been so incredibly evil, and it's I needed to be reminded of that. I mean, this was 100 years ago, and they were monsters. White people usually are, and Britain especially in the 20th century. It's not all Americans. You know, if Canadians actually had guns, we would have been too, and we certainly were to our native people. But I digress. But holy smokes, it was kind of delicious to add layers of hate for the British state reading this. I loved that. It's an anti-colonialist novel, but it's mostly a story of a multi-dimensional, tyrannical, patriarchal father and showing all the things going on inside of him that no, but that he doesn't allow anybody in his family to see, as well as his secret carousing life, that was just such a rich character study. Just incredible. I really, re with the proviso that there is, you know, it, sexual violence is a big part of the story, I really recommend it. Probably wait a year before I do the second one in the trilogy, but I certainly will be following up. So, like I say, it was a fabulous reading week in terms of what I finished. It was also pretty special in terms of what I've started, aside from the bales. I've started seven. I think that's more than I planned to start. For Aussie April, I have studied... I have studied... I have started this collection of short fiction by the Australian writer Elizabeth Harewer. So far, everyone who's Australian that I know in bookish social media has never heard of her, but other Twitter bookish types really mourned her passing last year, so that's what made me curious. And this collection is called A Few Days in the Country and Other Stories. 
published, I think, 2015. She's apparently not as well known for her short fiction as she is for her novels. I will definitely try her novels. I'm not sure about this, to be honest. I don't think it's going to be a bail, but these stories are... I've read two. I didn't love them, but I liked them. But they might be a little bit overly psychologized. I like psychological character portrayal. I like um, character studies. I like character work that review that go delves into psychological stuff. But it seems like the emphasis is on self awareness and not much else. And so I'm feeling a little bit unsatisfied. But interested to continue. Well, that's all I have to say about that so far, but they're start, it's starting out good, but not great. Now, it's interesting because this next one is also a satirical novel from India about a hundred years ago, Six Acres and a Third by Fakir Mohan Senapati, translated from the Oriya language by Rabbi Shankar Mishra, Satya P. Mohanty, Jatindra K. Nayak, and Paul St. Pierre. I'm enjoying it. I've read four chapters. It's very satirical and it's very intelligent satire. It's funny and it's about a zamindar in an Indian village. And it's set in, I think, the 1830s in Orissa. A zamindar is a rural landlord and it's very satirical about him. And there's something very almost witty, certainly humorous, about the way he is satirized because the tone of the narrative is very much mock heroic so tongue-in-cheek portraying him as an absolute hero but in fact you know anybody who's reading it with half a brain is realizing that they're actually poking at him and satirizing him and i'm enjoying it i'll see it's not that long of a novel i think it's just under 200 pages i don't think i'm going to get tired of it i don't know if it's going to go any deeper than satire but because the satire is kind of intelligent and it's humorous and it's about a part of the world that I don't know very much about. I'm enjoying it. Yeah. It's early days, but I have a much better feeling about it than I did about the Vietnamese satirical novel, which I didn't get along with at all. So far, so good. And this is for the readathon happening this month. Lit with Indian Lit, which is a readathon for translated Indian literature. And for the same readathon, inadvertently, because this was a buddy read that Jotsna of Jotsna's Bookscapades and I had planned for quite some time, No Presents, Please, a collection of short fiction by Giant Kaikini, translated from the Canada language by Tejaswini Niranjani. And I have to say the first story knocked my socks off. It is an excellent short story, excellently translated. And I was, I've been thinking about it all week since I read it last Saturday. It was called City Without Mirrors. It was about a confirmed bachelor. He's about 40 years old, liked his own company, was a hardworking guy, didn't think he'd ever get married. And uh, somebody knocks on his uh, little hovel where he lives in Mumbai and uh, that he doesn't know, but wants to set him up with his sister, who's also similar age. And it goes from there. It plays with image and metaphor in a way that's not too much because I don't like heavy symbolism, but it did that in a way that was just the right amount for me, and I was quite impressed. I was very, I was deeply impressed with the first story. There are 16 stories, so if my math is any good, which it's not, I think it's going to be a four-month buddy read, a story a week with Jotsna. And uh, if the rest of them are at least uh, almost as good as the first one, I'm going to enjoy this buddy read. I'm going to describe another problem that I had with Peru, the book for Peru for Invisible Cities, but I'm going to keep it short. The book that I kept hinting, the last two farty reads, I said, oh, there's this book that I'm experimenting with. So let me tell you about that because I didn't end up going with it. But I want to tell you about it because it might be interesting to other people. It's on Scribd. It's a work of poetry by a Peruvian Andean poet. Andean? Andean poet. Birds on the Kiswar Tree by Odi Gonzalez. And these poems, each poem is about a painting. And the paintings are from Quechua culture, which is an Andean indigenous language and cultural, cultural group, linguistic and cultural group. There's 10 million people that uh, speak the language, Quechua, 
It's the most uh, widely spoken Native American language in the Americas, also known as Runasimi. I don't pretend I know what I'm talking about. I'm just reading it to you. But there was a school of art in Peru's colonial era where a group of Quechua artists were trained by colonial Spanish masters. We're talking five or six hundred years ago. And then those Quechua artists started creating religious paintings based on the models and based on their training from their Spanish colonial, very talented painters. But then they started inserting and Quechuaizing the art. And this poet, Odi Gonzalez, has written a poem about, each poem is about a different work of art from these Quechua artists of the, I think the 1600s, 1700s, I've forgotten now. And it started out really good because the very first poem was about a work of art that I could Google, and so I could look at the painting and read the poem. And it's a bilingual, it's Spanish and, oh, well, maybe not Spanish, maybe it's Quechua language and English um, edition of the poetry. But having the painting, having the image in front of me while I read the poem, that was fascinating. That's my favorite kind of poetry. If A poem about a work of art that I can be looking at the art, because I'm not that great about appreciating art, and I'm not that great about appreciating poetry, so give me them both, and I might go a little deeper. But after that first poem, the next three poems, I couldn't Google my way into bringing up the art, and so I abandoned it only for that reason. Others of you, please check it out. Like I say, it's on Scribd, at least it is here in Japan, and that was an interesting idea. So I searched the crap out of Scribd, trying to find something Peruvian that would interest me. And I eventually did, and so far, so good. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't know how to pronounce this name. I have tried to find it, I can't, so somebody might be able to help me. It's an Afro-Peruvian writer, Lucia Charun Ilescas, and the novel is Malambo, and it is about an Afro-Peruvian artist, and I haven't quite got the historical setting, but I think he might be connected to these artists that I was reading the poetry about. Uh, it seems like it's the same era and kind of very similar kind of idea. It's really early days. I've just read a couple chapters, but the writing slash translation is good, which reminds me, Sean, name the translator by Emmanuel Harris II. And it's really obscure. Like I found it just, I, I, I just was searching and searching and finally Malambo and I clicked on it. And so it's about an, a black Peruvian artist way back in history. He lives on the other side of the Rimac River in Lima. And the story is, I'm having trouble getting my bearings, but it's just difficult enough to hold my interest, but not so difficult where I feel completely lost. And I've read maybe 15 pages and I'm enjoying it. I especially think the writing is good and the story starting out very interesting. So that is my Peruvian pick. Malambo by the Afro-Peruvian novelist Lucia Tarun Ilescas. Please help me with the pronunciation, someone. Yata in Japanese. Yata means I did it. Huh. That one took a long time to find. I have also started this British novel, The Mating Habits of Stags by Ray Robinson, and it is beautifully written. I am 24 pages into it, and I don't know much more than I told you last week. It's about a man, he's in his 70s, and he's out in nature on the run in Yorkshire. And he thinks, but he's not entirely sure, but he thinks he has killed a man. Uh, his wife died the year before, and the first chapter opens with a very se sexy uh, scene from their courtship decades previous. He's a nature lover, and so the descriptions of nature, I'm Googling so many things, I think... I could probably do three episodes of In Other Words on the language from this book, but it's really interesting. If anybody's looking for a fiction pick for the Springathon, I see that Heidi and Doris both put out their announcement videos for Springathon. Why not? I'll put a link in the show notes to those, but this would be a good pick for a fiction book because the nature writing in here is lush. And I did start volume two of the Country Girls trilogy by Edna O'Brien. In my edition, it's called The Lonely Girl, and in other editions, it has a different title. I can't remember. I'll put it in the show notes. I've read a third of it. This is a buddy read with Sonia of an enthusiastic reader. We did 
volume one, 10 chapters a week, but we're not in a big hurry. So we're going to, we slowed it down by half. We're going to read five chapters a week. So those first five chapters were great. I wasn't sure at first, but there's a lot of humor in volume two, The Lonely Girl. Some um, dates and romantic situations where the uh, main character, the autobiographical persona, persona of Edna, um, got into some real scrapes and it's really comic as well as many other emotional tones to the novel, but quite a lot more humor so far than there was in the first one. And that's working for me. And finally, the last one that I started the past week was this novella from Australia, Farewell My Orange by Iwaki K, translated from the Japanese by Meredith McKinney. It's starting out really good. There are alternate chapters. One is focused on a Nigerian refugee in Australia, and the, the other voice is of a Japanese, she's not a refugee, but Japanese immigrant to Australia. And I've so far read one by each. They're very different voices, very different writing styles, and yes, different fonts, and I'm enjoying it. Yeah, it's already grabbed hold of me. That's what's newly in progress over the past week. So I will be starting maybe four books. I'm not sure. I haven't counted. One of them is a book that the buddy we didn't get started last week for very important reasons, and we'll start this weekend. Buddy Read with Britta Bowler of this collection of African-American short fiction by Tony Cade Bambera, Gorilla My Love. First story we will buddy read this week. I can't wait. This was originally published in 1972, so it's not new, but I don't care. Uh, not new is usually better than new, and uh, I've been hearing really good things about her for years. It's finally time to give her a try. I plan to start this for Aussie April, The Lebs by Michael Mohammed Ahmad. He is a Lebanese-Australian writer, and this is about a Lebanese-Australian family and their nipples. <laughs> Jacqueline of Six Minutes for Me did a review, got my interest, not just because of the cover, and I'm going to be diving in in the coming week. I will also be doing some further experimentation with Vietnamese American or Viet Vietnamese novels written in English. So I hope to have something to tell you about next week, but I'm not going to speculate now because I don't have time. And this is going to be a buddy read with Britta Bowler. Britta, buddy reader Britta. Britta Bowler and Lindy and myself. And this is the latest Tina Cover translation to be published. A Beast in Paradise by Cecile Coulon, translated by Tina Cover, just published a few months ago, a few weeks ago. French novel about a woman possessed by the land of their birth. That is the first time I've read anything on the back cover. I don't want to know another blessed thing before we dive in. We're going to do this over two weeks, and our first check-in is next weekend. So I'll probably just have a bare start on this when I see you next Friday, but I will have started it. I am planning to start a book that's on the Lambda Literary Awards list, long list, short list, I don't know. A work of queer Korean fiction. Hey, this is Editing Sean. I had a bit of a brain fart at this point in the video because I never did um, say the name of the book. And I also mistakenly said that it was a Korean novel, and it's in fact by a Korean-American writer. The novella is Neo Tenica, and the author is Jun Olichi Lee, and it is uh, has a lot of Korean and Korean-American characters, and the theme, or the central preoccupation of at least some of these characters is an interior femininity, neither transgender nor homosexual. That sounds interesting. That is on script and it's very short. I am also going to start for the other Invisible Cities country this month, Equatorial Guinea, and I'm going to start By Night the Mountain Burns by Juan Thomas Avila Laurel. I just have to say, when you're looking for pronunciation and you go on YouTube and so many recorded panel presentations or readings or even Zoom chats where they don't, nobody says the name of the author, it drives me up the wall. Okay, Juan Thomas Avila Laurel. That last one, I'm not sure I got right. And uh, he is Equatorial Guinea's uh, best-known writer, that, at least in translation. 
and I will be I have two of his, at least two of his novels on Scribd. The one I'm going to try is By Night the Mountain Burns. Yeah, my reading life is great. My foot is still getting better, but it's very slow, but it's getting better, so don't worry. Thanks for your concern. Not going to focus on aches and pains in this Friday Reads, but my reading life is fabulous. Yours too, I hope. Thanks for watching.